Hello to those of you who are joining us. Um, if you would like to take a few moments to um, pop into the chat where you're joining us from tonight, we'd love to hear um, where in the US or beyond you're, you're, you're hanging out tonight. Um, I know that uh, personally I'm calling in from South Carolina. We've got um, Catherine with us who's calling in from Georgia. Um, you're gonna be hearing later from some people from uh, also from South Carolina and uh, also from Colorado. Um, oh, I see we've got people coming in from Austin, Texas, Laguna Hills, California, Southern California, the Anaheim area. Oh, this is really fun. Um, it's so much fun having people join from all across the US to explore these gardens together. So thank you for joining us tonight. We'll be getting started here in just a minute. I'm gonna wait until 6.01 Eastern time to kick this off. That way then if anyone is just having um, some difficulties getting their Zoom up and running, they'll, they'll get kind of a leniency minute. <laughs> All right. Well, it is time to kick off our tours. I'm going to start with just a quick technology orientation. Um, just so you're aware, closed captioning is available for tonight's webinar. Um, if you need that closed captioning or any other type of assistance along those lines, feel free to use the CC button at the bottom of your Zoom. Or if you need um, any other technology help, I'll be happy to get to that. Um, this webinar is being recorded and the recording will be made up and available um, soon, um, as well as yesterday's. I see that's a question that came in. I will be getting yesterday's recording up as well. I'm afraid I was um, taking advantage of my weekend, but hopefully I will get both those downloaded and put up um, late tonight, uh, tomorrow morning. So yes, those will definitely be made available and posted soon. Um, um, the last thing I'd like to let you know is that you can use the Q&A button or the chat throughout the evening to post any questions you might have for our gardens who are presenting tonight, and we'll be sure and get your answers question, uh, sorry, questions answered um, as quickly as possible. So um, without further ado, I don't want to take up too much more of Atlanta Botanical Gardens time. So I'd like to introduce Catherine Masuda, who is the Youth Programs Manager at Atlanta Botanical Garden, um, and take it away, Catherine. Hi, good evening. Thank you all so much for joining us tonight. I am really happy to share the Atlanta Botanical Garden with you. I have worked here since 2004, and I really love this space, and I think it's a wonderful place for all of you to see today. So thank you for joining me, and thank you for listening to my presentation. So the Atlanta, let me tell you first about our presentation and what we're going to be talking about today. So this right here is the map of the Atlanta Botanical Garden. We are 30 acres. We're not gonna be able to talk about the entire space today, just a few of the different gardens, but first we're gonna start off with the Levy Partier Garden. And then from there, we're going to go to the Rose Garden and then the Edible Garden. After the edible garden, we'll go to our conservation garden and talk about some of our carnivorous insect eating plants. And then we're gonna go into our Fuqua Conservatory. There's four rooms in there that we'll visit, the tropical rotunda, the desert house, as well as the orchid display house and high elevation room. It's gonna be, I love that space. You'll really enjoy it. And then we're gonna pop back over to the woods to our outdoor garden to walk along our canopy walk. And you will see part of our summer exhibition done by Patrick Schoen in Poetic Kinetics called Dream Flora. And then we'll also talk about the earth goddess in our Cascades garden. Beyond that, I'm gonna also talk about some glass work done by Jason Gamrick that we also have here this summer. So all these things we're gonna talk about in the next 40 minutes or so, leaving time for questions. So without further ado, I wanted to go through a brief history of the Atlanta Botanical Garden. So we were formed in 1976 by a group of volunteers on a corner of Piedmont Park. And since then, this is our original trailer, our original entrance. We have grown a lot in those past 45 years. Here's our current visitor center that it is you can see today. Um, some big milestones in our history. We opened up our Fuqua Conservatory in 1989 and then followed that with the Orchid Center in 2002 behind the conservatory. And then in 2010, we opened up our canopy walk through the treetops, which we'll walk along today. And then we'll also go through our edible garden as well, which opened up in 2010. 
So without further ado, let's go looking at our outdoor garden spaces. The first one I wanted to share with you today is our Partier Garden. This is a video from the sky that you can see. And I wanted to point out to you that a Partier Garden, you can notice that there's straight beds, there's delineated spots that are planted on, and it, par Partier Gardens are very formal gardens. This one is a summer planting that you can see here. And then we're gonna to go to our spring planting. And this is what we currently have right now here at the Atlanta Botanical Garden. This shot is from a hillside where there's some swings. So if you were to visit us today, you could sit on the swings and look out at this vista of these beautiful blue, white, and pink flower planting. Right in the middle of the Partier Garden, we have the Dale Chihuly Fountain. This one was part of our show that we had with him in 2004. And um, we loved this piece so much in the fountain in the middle of our Partier Garden that we wanted to keep it. So we've kept this Dale Chihuly piece since 2004. And I love the blue with the planting that we have here. So right now in our spring planting, we have a lot of blues, we have a lot of whites. Um, you can see those tall blue flowers are delphiniums. Those pink flowers are called gomfrinas, pink pong lavender. We also have Swiss chard, the light green, the bigger leaves, and then those white little flowers are a type of euphorbia that's planted. So it kind of gives all the different kind of colors to our spring planting. This all is gonna go away next week and they're gonna replant it all for, with full annuals for next week. Let's move on to our next outdoor space. This is our rose garden. And you may, when you look at this, notice that we don't really have only roses planted. We have a lot of annuals and perennials planted in this garden so that we can make sure that it's beautiful all the time. In Atlanta, roses only really bloom in May and October. There's some that blew other, bloom other times, but the annuals and perennials kind of help it look pretty all the time. One of my favorite annuals is this foxglove that you see we're zooming into. This plant is a medicinal plant. So certain compounds in the leaves are used as an anti-inflammatory heart medication that's prescribed for congestive heart, to treat congestive heart failure. Sorry, I got my words all mixed up. So it is a medicinal plant, but it's also highly toxic. The leaves, the flowers, all of that could potentially harm you. So never eat a foxglove ever and make sure your animals keep away from it. I really love the name of foxgloves. And so one of the reasons the name that I found on the internet was that the foxes could put those little florets on their fingers and it would muffle their footfalls while they were hunting their prey. So that's a one way that the foxgloves might have gotten their name. So in our rose garden, we have primarily old garden roses. And old garden roses is a class of roses that existed before the introduction of the first hybrid tea rose in 1867. So they're just an older variety of rose that have been around a really long time. They're very immensely in their growth habit, fragrance, color, size. There's no one type of old world rose. But the reason we choose a lot of the roses, more importantly beyond old garden roses, is we want them to be easy. Atlanta is not an easy place for roses to grow. There's high humidity, there is um, heavy clay soils, and the roses aren't always very happy. But we wanna choose roses that are gonna do well in this environment regardless of those conditions. We don't wanna have a bunch of plants that we take care of all the time. We want them to do well and to thrive. There's something called the rose rosette. It's a virus that has come in the past couple of years. There's no cure for this virus. And when roses get it, there's some gnarled new growth and then the plant declines. So in the past several years, we've had to do a huge culling of a rose collection where we've had to take out a lot of those diseased plants. And then we've replanted them with roses that are do better against that disease. We're gonna scroll in here. You can see those fox gloves again. This is a poppy, not a rose. And I love the different colors of the poppy and the seed pods. They'll kind of self seed around our rose garden as well sometimes a little bit too much. So here you can see close up of some of the different roses that we have in our rose garden. It's a really beautiful place and we have lots of weddings and special events that happen in our rose garden. So come and see it in the May or October if you guys can. Let's go to our next outdoor space and go to our edible garden. This is, um, used to be a parking lot. We converted it to our edible garden. We say 
asphalt to asparagus. The first plant I wanted to show you is Camellia sinensis. This lovely bushy plant behind me is the basis for all teas. Black, green, white, oolong tea all come from the leaf buds of this Camellia plant. Depending on how they process and ferment the leaves, it gets the different flavors for the different teas. I think it's interesting that they all come from the same kind of plant. So our edible garden, we really want to showcase how edible plants can be beautiful. It is not just a planting that is um, you hide in your backyard. We want it to be something you put on your front yard, show your neighbors how you can grow things that are delicious as well as um, beautiful. We have a lot of colors and edible flowers. So these pansies are edible right along with the beautiful cabbage that you see there. And then up here at the top, this bluish flower is a borage. And I wanted to show you a picture of it because I don't think you can see it very well in the video. The flowers are edible as well as the leaves have a cucumber-like flavor. So we do put a lot of edible flowers inside of our edible garden to give that pop of color. Here we have our row crops. We've got eggplant, basil, peppers, cucumbers, and nasturtiums planted in our row crops for the summer this year. We have our blueberries, which aren't ready yet, but they will be ready probably in July. I was really curious to see snapdragons in our edible garden. Those are those tall pink flowers you see behind me. They are edible, but they're not supposed to be very delicious. Unlike right here, you see we have some nasturtiums and the leaves have like a peppery flavor and you can eat the flowers. And apparently if you pickled the seed pods, they're supposed to taste like capers. I have never had nasturtium seed pods, but I love capers, so I'm willing to try it. One of the plants that I get asked about the most at the Atlanta Botanical Garden is this tree behind me. You see the tall cone tree? That is our meta sequoia or a dawn redwood. And it, we planted it in about 1980. So it's been there for about 41 years. It's a relatively fast growing tree. As you can see, it's not a very old tree. And it was interesting because we don't trim it. So this is just the shape that the tree grows, it has that beautiful cone shape. Another interesting thing about this tree is that it was thought to be extinct, but it was rediscovered or discovered in 1941 in China. I can't imagine in the middle of World War II China, someone finding a grove of trees that they thought was extinct, but now it's pretty more available in the plant trade and um, planted all around the world. So that is our Meta Sequoia Dawn Redwood right at the base of our edible garden. It is not edible, that tree, but it is beautiful to see from there. The next outdoor garden that I wanted to share with you is going to be our conservation garden. So this is a, a space where we can showcase some of the plants that we work with in the Southeast. I wanted to give a quick shout out to our conservation department. They do a lot of work to protect organs, um, organ, organisms, um, plants from all over the world, especially in the Southeast. They have a micropropagation lab where they grow difficult plants from seeds to help safeguard important collections, plant them back in the wild. They do species recovery efforts, all sorts of programs they do. And this is kind of a garden space where we can showcase some of those plants, particularly the Saracenia, which are these tall pitcher plants with the white tops. You see the little tall tubes there with the white tops. They have these burgundy purple, these burgundy flowers right now in May. I love the pitcher plant flower. Here is one that's kind of bushy. It's got more petals on it than the other ones. And then here's another close up of the cool pitcher plant flowers. So let's talk about the pitcher plants. This is another type of pitcher plant. This one has more lime green flowers. So you can see the tall pitcher, but then there's also those lime green flowers kind of next to it. So these pitcher plants are carnivorous, which means that they eat insects. They grow often in nutrient poor soil. So in order to get the nutrients they need to survive, a lot of plants have adapted to capture and digest insects. These pitcher plants are passive traps, which means that they don't shut or close an insect, but they are a place where the insects fall and they can't get out of. And so right at the top of the pitcher plant, there is nectar that the insects love to eat. The insects come, they're eating the nectar, and right where that nectar is, there's all these little fuzzy hairs or a super slippery slide side. And so as the insect is eating the nectar, it slips and falls down into the tube, and then it can't crawl back out because the sides are so slippery. Interesting enough, these carpenter bees that you see behind me, they'll eat their way out. 
So sometimes insects do get out of there, but I've seen butterfly wings in there. I've also one time saw a lizard skeleton inside one of these pitcher plants when I was cutting them open with kids. They're really neat to see and really interesting to watch grow and just to see the insects coming around in there. The other carnivorous plant that I wanted to talk to you about today is the Venus flytrap. This is also in our conservation garden. It is pretty widely um, traded or bought in the plant trade, but in the wild it is not doing as well. They also grow in wet woodland, wetland areas, get extra nutrients, and they're native to North and South Carolina. So I know we've got some people from North and South Carolina out there seeing these Venus's flytraps. How they work is there's these trigger hairs inside of those adapted leaves. And I'm gonna to touch these trigger hairs and you have to touch the hair twice or one hair two times in order to trigger it to close so that the plant doesn't close with any random breeze. It wants to make sure it's an insect that's in there, not a stick, sorry trap that I did that to you, but it wants to make sure that the trap closes around an insect. So we have those in our conservation along with these sundews. You can see how it might have gotten the name sundew because it has these little tentacles on there with little bits of dew. And these bits of dew are super sticky. And when an insect lands on the sundews, it can't fly away because of that stickiness from that liquid. And this plant will move a little bit. So some of those tentacles and some of that goo, it'll start producing more of the goo to really stick the insect on there. And also, um, help digest the insect as well. So the insects are broken down by enzymes. The insides are broken down, kind of make a bug juice. And then the leaves of carnivorous plants will absorb that bug juice in through the leaf to get those extra nutrients. It would be kind of like if you were to get an apple and absorb all the nutrients by holding the apple. That's kind of how a carnivorous plant absorbs those nutrients from bugs. And you'll notice here, I'm gonna move my screen. Right next to me, you can see there's a, whoop, there's a little bug that's caught on this sundew plant that we had, that we caught on video. So those are our sundews in the conservation bog area. It's a really neat spot to walk through to see all the insects caught. Right next to it, we have our skyline garden. This is a new space that we just opened. Those stone pillars are original to an exhibition that happened in the 1800s in Piedmont Park that we kept. And we have them offset by those really modern metal pillars. This garden, we wanna showcase how you can grow plants that are from desert regions in Atlanta and which plants do well. We don't want diva plants here. We want plants that are easy. So these are plants that we can grow well here in the Atlanta area um, and good soil, good plant selection. You can have a desert-like scape in Atlanta if you like. From here, let's go ahead and go inside. I wanna talk about our um, Fuqua Conservatory and the rooms inside of there. The first spot is our conservatory lobby. So in this room, we have seasonal changes. So in the winter time, we'll have poinsettias. Right now we have these wall displays of orchids and different colored foliage plants. And then the first room you'll go to is the tropical rotunda. And inside our tropical rotunda, we want to create a really naturalistic environment for a rainforest. And many of you guys may be hearing, I hope you can hear the poison dart frogs calling. So that is our phantismal poison dart frog. We have them loose inside of this room. They help us with insect control and they're no longer poisonous. So in the wild, poison dart frogs are poisonous from their diet, but they're not eating those same things in our conservatory. So they're no longer toxic and they're no longer dangerous to any visitors coming by, but they create this really wonderful sound and make the room feel like you're in a rainforest. We want it to sound like a rainforest. We want the air to feel like a rainforest and also to look like a rainforest. We planted all sorts of plants in this room to help create a diverse experience. We have palms, ferns, cycads, conifers, um, everything you can imagine that might be from a tropical region all over the world. One of our more popular plants is right behind me is our citrus vine. The vine itself grows along the ceiling. And then what we're seeing here are the roots of the vine that are seeking out the soil. We never quite let them get there. We'll trim them, we'll thin them out so that the cystus vine does not take over the entire room. But it's a really neat spot. You just feel immersed when you're walking by underneath all those vines hanging down from the ceiling. 
some tropical rainforest, a lot of plants at the forest floor have struggled with gaining light. And there's a lot of adaptations for rainforest plants on the forest floor as a way to seek more light. In tropical rainforest, you'll see a lot of really large leaves. You'll also see a lot of leaves that are darker green. You might see leaves that have a reddish underside to them. And all of those is part of absorbing more color. So, or more sunlight. The darker colors absorb more light than lighter colors, like white. So a lot of rainforest plants have those really dark greens inside of them. So this is our tropical rotunda room. And I wanted to start and transfer from here to talk about some of my favorite plants that are really interesting. This is the cacao tree. We get chocolate from the seed pods inside of there. There's little beans that people process and ferment to make the chocolate that we know and love. And then related to the chocolate is the Haryana baliensis. This is also edible, like the chocolate is, the fruits are, and it's highly endangered to Ecuador. It's got really cool, beautiful flowers. People often don't think of conifers as growing in tropical regions, but they do. And we have a huge conifer collection that are native to tropics, particularly um, New Caledonia in the Pacific. A lot of these conifers are extremely rare and extremely hard to grow, but we really have a huge conifer collection. If you were to come, you'll see tons of them all over the Fuqua Conservatory. The other interesting plant we have in here is the giant timber bamboo. It grows really fast. It could grow up to a foot a day um, until it gets to 65 or 100 feet tall. And it also is a very firm, sustainable hardwood that you can build with. And so a lot of people consider it a sustainable plant to grow for building materials because it grows so fast. And you can see the top of our bamboo is cut because if we did not cut it, it would keep growing and burst through the top of our greenhouse. And we have had plants break through the top of our glass houses and have to replace glass because of their growth habits. So that's our tropical rotunda. I wanted to now move to our desert house. These are all plants native to South America, I mean, not South America, South Africa whew, and Madagascar. A lot of people walk into this room and wanna talk about all the different cactus that they see, but there are no cactus inside of this room. Cactus look very similar to a lot of other desert plants all over the world because they have that succulent behavior, that succulent thick fleshy stems, um, spines, but these plants, even though they're succulents, are not cactus. A cactus is a part of a particular plant family that primarily grows in the Americas, North, Central, and South America, which is why we're so familiar with it. But in Africa and Madagascar, there really aren't any plants in the Cactaceae family. But there are lots of succulents. So here we have a lot of fleshy plants that help them um, store water in those really dry environments. And so in this room, we have a lot of really highly toxic plants. Whenever the people in this room are starting to work on the plants, removing them, trimming them back, some of them have to wear hazmat suits where their body is completely covered so that they don't get any bit of sap on them that can burn their skin, blind them, make them sick. One of the more popular, not popular, but interesting plants to talk about that's toxic is this one behind me. It's the candelabra tree. And this plant is highly toxic. It can cause skin blistering as well as blindness if the sap inside were to get on your skin. But people use it to hunt. They will cut off a piece of this plant, carefully drizzle that poisonous latex onto like a grass bundle. And then they throw that bundle into some water where it will kill all of the fish nearby. The fish float to the surface. People can harvest those fish. And then when they cook it and eat it, they are able to, um, they can still eat it. It's not harmful anymore once the plant, once the fish have been cooked. So that's another really highly toxic plant inside of this room. I would never recommend people to touch plants in this room, especially if any of them have broken leaves. There are just a lot of really toxic plants. So unlike the tropical rainforest where we saw very thick, big leaves, we saw very dark green leaves, this room will have a lot of smaller leaves and we'll have a lot of lighter leaves, the whitish colors, the light greens to reflect the sunlight. Deserts tend to have a lot of sun. They don't have a lot of water, but they have a lot of sun. 
And so plants have a lighter color to reflect that sunlight to help protect some of the water inside of the leaves. A lot of the adaptations that you see for plants in the desert house are about protecting water and holding on to that water to make sure that it's not lost. One of our big collections in this room are aloes. So behind me, you can see those aloe-like plants. There are over 550 50 species of aloes worldwide. We have many in the desert house. There are some that are used medicinally like aloe vera, but many are actually really toxic. So a lot of the aloes that we have in there also wouldn't be ones that you'd wanna rub on your skin like you would aloe vera. This plant behind me, the speckled one, this is a lily that is from a desert. You can see it's got a little flower spike that's coming up that's gonna have little white blooms. Those yellow flowers, that's an aloe plant that's flowering with those yellow flowers. And then you can see we have this spiky aloe plant right behind me. You can see there's just a lot of diversity in the aloe family. They've got spots and not spots. I love the bulbous bottoms on these plants. These flowers are called rosy periwinkle and they are used for the treatment of leukemia and have been a really strong medicinal plant, plant much like the foxgloves. So here we have a desert orchid that's in bloom. It's got this long spike that comes down. You can see it's just got these beautiful stripes on the leaves. We love wildlife inside of our Fugal Conservatory. So here we have our radiated tortoises. They are native to the spiny deserts of Madagascar. They are endangered in the wild due to habitat loss, um, poaching, they're really popular in the pet trade and also local consumption. Ours were bred in captivity and they were also um, given to us as rescues. And so now they're living out their life in our desert house, enjoying a salad every day. They always look like they're having a nice time in our desert house. So that's a quick tour of our desert house. I want to now transfer us over into our orchid display room. So this was opened in 2002 and it displays our orchid collection. Behind me, you see a glass sculpture. We're gonna talk more about those glass sculptures towards the end. So when I started working at the Lamb Channel Garden, I had no idea of the diversity of orchids. There are so many different shapes and sizes. We have over 2000 species of orchids in our collection. Here we have some pansy orchids behind me. They look like pansies, but they're really orchids. Um, but there's so many different shapes and sizes to orchids. This one right here is a gongora. It's part of our national collection. So we have a certain collections that we really focus on and that gongora is one of them. But there isn't one kind of orchid that has a specific shape. Some have different petals, different sizes and shapes. So we're gonna see a lot of variety with orchids today during our tour. Worldwide, there's about 35, 25 to 30,000 orchid species. This is a Corianthes, a bucket orchid. It has fluid inside that bucket. And when an insect goes in to pollinate it or to get nectar, it'll not nectar, it goes to get smells. I'm losing my words. So in that one, it, a lot of these orchids are pollinated by bees that are trying to attract females by creating a perfume. They're called euglossian bees. The males go and rub their bodies on different orchids to collect different smells to get a certain cocktail. So in that bucket orchid, the, bee would fall inside and have to be forced through this tube to get out. Here you'll see a lot of Vanda orchids. These have fabulous huge blooms as you can see, but also their root structures are really interesting. A lot of these will be growing up in treetops and their roots are completely exposed. And since it's in a tropical wet region, their water and nutrient needs are all met by the air. This is another orchid that's part of our national collection like the um, Gongora, this is a Stanhopia, a different kind of orchid. You can see just the varieties of shapes and colors. It's just really pretty incredible. All of the different shapes and sizes and smells you get in this room. Some smell like dirty underwear and some smell like fragrant menthol, like you rubbed menthol, vapor rub on your chest. These are lady slipper orchids. I don't know if these look like lady slippers to you, but to me, I can totally see how these look like lady slippers. Sorry, my light just went out in the room. Um, and people, scientists and botanists don't quite know why they have those little weird growths on there. Does it attract insects by looking like rotten meat? Who knows? In the front of the room, we have a lot of 
bo um, boxes that they put in and out and pots that they plant in and out. And then the back of the room, it's a lot more naturalistic. A lot more things are planted in the ground. And you can see we don't only have orchids planted in this room. There's a lot of other foliage kind of plants. This is a lady dancer orchid. Does this look like a lady dancing? Skirt, arms out, headdress. I can see the lady dancing in that one. These leaves are begonias. It's a type of begonia. And look at those fabulous silver spots. And these flowers are not orchids, they're torch gingers. And they have a really nice sweet smell to them. The other day, one of our staff members was watering back there and there was a lot of little flies flying around the torch gingers. And he said there was a frog right on the top eating the little flies as they were coming by. And I really enjoyed the stems of those plants. You can see the different colors and patterns on there. So that was our orchid display house. Those are primarily orchids that grow in warm environments and lower level, lower elevations. We have a second orchid room called our tropical high elevation house. So these are orchids that would grow at six to 10,000 feet, a lot cooler of an environment in this room. Right now we're zooming into our tropical blueberries. These are rel rel related to our temperate blueberries but they are higher in antioxidants. They are two to four times higher in antioxidants than our native or temperate blueberries that we have here. They're not all that tasty though. They're kind of just pretty bland, um, but they are really cool to see growing in there. So this room, because it's supposed to represent high elevations and cooler temperatures, we have a special way to cool it. We cool it with something called an air washer. And it's originally from textile factories where they have to keep fabric really cool and moist. They don't want the cotton to get staticky in a dry environment where it can break. So they have an air washer, which is basically a wall of water, and then air is shot through that wall of water really quickly. And so when the air comes out on the other side, it's cool, but also moist. Because air conditioning can dry out a lot of these orchid plants inside of this room. Here we have a really beautiful Masdevallia orchids. Aren't these just gorgeous? We're going to transition from orchids in this room to talk quickly about sun pitchers. So these are not orchid plants. They grow on the top of the Tapui Mountains in Venezuela. They are carnivorous, which means they eat meat. The Tapui Mountains are really remote. They're um, rock structures. The top does not have any soil on there. They're hard to get to. And as a result, there's not a lot of nutrients in the soil. So these sun pitchers have adapted to capture and digest insects. That little red top curved to the top has nectar in it. The insects come and they eat that nectar. And then while they're there, they might trip and fall on the slippery sides. There's also hairs. The insects fall down inside and then there's a bacteria that digests them so that they um, can, those plants can get the extra nutrients in order to survive. These are really neat plants. And then other plants that are also carnivorous on top of there, there's a carnivorous bromeliad and bromeliads are in the pineapple, you guys know the top of a pineapple. That's what these kind of look like here. And the tallest one that we're coming up to the top, that's a carnivorous bromeliad that eats insects as well. Usually bromeliads are known as a place where tadpoles can live in the treetops, but that one eats them. This gorgeous orchid is a lady slipper, a South American lady slipper. Look at those long petals coming down the sides. I just love lady slippers. We have a gorgeous collection here and a lot of diversity in them. We saw that some of them in the other room and now we have more lady slippers in, in there. So that was an orchid. This is a, not an orchid. It's another carnivorous plant called Nepenthes pitcher. These also grow in Borneo, another high elevation place. Um, and they attract insects. A lot of carnivorous plants, I don't know if any of you have noticed this, have like a reddish color, a yellow color. They really seek to look a lot like a flower. And many of them do produce nectar to lure those insects in. But instead of being a flower, these are adapted leaves. So the leaves make those traps that trap the insect. And these Nepenthes pitchers have a lot of different shapes and sizes. There's lots of different varieties of them. And these are also a highly endangered species. These orchids are called bonnet orchids. They grow right out of the top of those leaves. And I just love to see how they're growing. This one has so many blooms on them. Look at all these blooms from these chlorothallus would be the scientific name for these bonnet orchids. 
So this room, this is also another pleurothallus. A lot of these rooms, these orchids are really unique. They're also really tiny. So when you're walking through this room, you may only see a couple orchids. But when you slow down and stop to look, this orchid's probably about the size of my pinky fingernail. You can, so it's hard to find them. You've really got to go slow, take your time, look for all those little treasures inside this room because it's a really special place to see orchids from all over these really cool tropical areas. So that was our tropical high elevation house. I want us now to transition to go back outside and talk about Jason Gamreth. So Jason Gamreth is a glass artist based out of Seattle, out of Washington. And um, he makes glass work uh, based on plants. He started creating sculptures at the age of 15 and he's attended the Pilchuck Glass School, which is an international center for glass art education founded by Dale Chihuly. So he's been doing glass art for a really long time. His work has been shown across seven countries and he really wants to capture the details that are overlooked in small plants. So we just saw the small plants in the orchid center. So these are bigger and they're more life-size. So maybe you might notice all those little details that you didn't notice when you see the plant on a smaller scale. All of his pieces are hand blown. So you can see that they aren't just created, created with a mold. He has over um, 50 people, dedicated artists, craft persons, consultants, helped him create the artwork that we have on display here at the Atlanta Botanical Garden this summer. There's lots of different pieces that go into this. So we'll see all these assembled in some lotus in a minute. And these are different aloe flowers that you can see all laid out. And we'll see them in a minute also in a sculpture. So let's look at the let's look at his work that is displayed in the garden. We have over 13 installations throughout the garden that consist of over 150 pieces total. Here you can see some of our orchids, the glass orchids that he made. These are some Phalaenopsis as well as a lady slipper orchid. Here are the aloes. So you guys saw all of those little aloe pieces that were spread out on the ground. Each one of these aloe sculptures has 500 hand-blown glass pieces in them. These are my favorite that he has. These are the lotuses. Each have 100 pieces of hand-blown glass in each one of those flowers. And here we have the Saracenias. You saw the pitcher plants that we that were carnivorous in our conservation garden. These are orchids that are based or sculptures that are based on those. And Venus's flytrap, we saw those as well in our conservation garden. And here we have some more orchids on display outside. So this is not all of the glasswork that we have. These are just a few of the ones and a few of the installations. So if any of you guys can make it out to see the exhibition, it would be great. This is our um, Columbine flowers. And you can see it's right by our cafe where people can come and eat when they are visiting the Atlanta Botanical Garden. So the last the other part of our art exhibition that we have this summer. So we have Jason Gamreth, who does the artwork for uh, the glasswork, but we also have another artist here called um, Poetic Kinetics. And it's done by Patrick Shern, based out of Los Angeles. And he has a Skynet series, which are huge sculptures through the sky and overhead that shimmer and move. And before I showed you our Skynet that we have here called Dream Flora, I wanted to show you a quick video of them making the piece because I feel like you kind of have to see them make it. So I'm going to disappear for a minute and I'm going to let you guys watch this video and I'll be right back.
Okay, so that was them making the piece um, out in LA. And let me go ahead and start the video to show you it here at the Atlanta Botanical Garden. So the piece was installed. This is called Dream Flora, and it's through our canopy. So it's into the woods, starts in Southern Seasons Garden, and then it goes out along our canopy walk. And it was created by Patrick Shearn of Poetic Kinetics. And each of these sky nets is unique. So he's created them in Berlin and Lisbon, Portugal. He's also created them in the United Arab Emirates and in different places in the United States. There's gonna be a huge piece in Washington DC as well. And all these are unique and site specific. Because of the coronavirus, his team did not get to come out here to see the space before they created the piece. So all of this was designed using 3D modeling. And the first time that they were here was when they started to install it a couple weeks ago. So I took this video on a day that it was relatively calm. There wasn't a lot of wind, but when it is, when there is wind, those little vinyl sheets will move with the wind and the whole piece will kind of flutter and move and there's a lot of movement in there. The inspiration for Patrick Schoen are flocking birds. And if you can think about fish in the ocean that kind of come together and then break apart that movement of in nature is what inspired him to do this Skynet series. Um, unfortunately, you just don't get to see that movement here, but there it are windy days in Atlanta, so you can come and check it out when it happens. Um, so the, in this piece, it covers over 12,500 square feet. It has 78,000 streamers in it. And each of those streamers and all of those ropes were tied by hand. So the only thing not done by hand is the cutting of those vinyl strips. Everything else was done by hand. And to install it, we partnered with a local tree cutting company that went up into the treetops to help string these through the treetops to kind of give you this experience. So this piece is along our canopy walkway. The canopy walkway that you're seeing here opened in 2010, and it is 600 feet long. The highest point is 40 feet, and it is um, uh, a place where you can get through the treetops. We really enjoyed seeing some of the smaller plants grow up to the level of the canopy so it can feel more immersive. So this is the canopy walk from the bottom. And when they put this, built this canopy walk, it was really important to them to keep those larger tree specimens still alive, to not just clear cut the whole area. So it was a lot of, a lot of work to make sure that this canopy was put in just right so that we could still have those larger tree species and have a canopy walk. I wanted to quickly point out, uh, this is below the canopy walk looking up. You see those white flowers behind me? Those are oak leaf hydrangeas native to, to the Southeast. And I love, they're one of my favorite hydrangeas that you can see blooming throughout the summer here. So the canopy walk goes through an area called Storza Woods. And it's woodland that was originally part of a gentleman's driving club. And they purchased it in the 1870s, this area. But it was never intensively farmed or cleared, but it still was used quite a bit. And the Atlanta Botanical Garden had that, has gotten this land when we incorporated and we've really enjoyed having this woodland setting to be able to showcase some of the shady plants because here in Georgia and in Atlanta, it's a shady environment. So a lot of people have a place in their backyard that may look like this. And what kind of plants could they grow? I wanted to geek out about one of my favorite plants here. This is called a tiger fern. Look at those leaves. You can see the patterns and the colors on there. There aren't a lot of plants that will encourage our horticulturists to go the extra mile, but this tiger fern, they bring it in every winter. They've been propagating it, trying to get more of them to grow. This is a smoke tree with those really beautiful pinkish flowers. It does look like billowing smoke and they can get quite large. This beautiful flower is a magnolia. It's an umbrella magnolia. And the flowers can be the size of dinner plates. So they're huge. And those leaves are also really long. That's how they got the name Umbrella Magnolia. They are native to the Southeast as well. And you may notice that this flower looks a lot like our logo. So in the bottom corner of the screen, you see our logo there. That is also a magnolia. So I really love the magnolia species. This is our Cascades Garden. So in this garden, we have our Earth Goddess. She is part of a mosaic culture piece that was done by International Mosaic Culture of Montreal. She came to us in 2013, part of our Imaginary Worlds exhibition, and she was designed to be specifically for this place. 
She can't go anywhere else. She will be with us always. She's planted every summer. She has over 20,000 plants on her. So unlike a topiary that you trim and cut, she is a sculpture, like a metal frame, filled with soil, wrapped with horticulture cloth, and then individually planted to give that different look and texture to her. We just started planting her mid-April. She's all planted now, but it takes a little bit of time for those plants to fill in. So right now she looks a little speckled, but if you were to come back in the middle of summer or early fall, you would see her completely filled in. And she changes over to the ice goddess during our garden light show in the winter time. So that is all that I have for you guys today. Um, I wanted to see if there are any questions. I'm looking over here. This is where my Zoom screen is. So please forgive me for looking over. Um, hold Thanks, on. I'm Catherine. Over. You're welcome. Thank you so much. Oh my goodness. What an amazing uh, way to get to see the Atlanta <laughs> Botanic Garden. Um, I, I love that presentation style. It was wonderful. Thank you. Um, we certainly have some questions that have come in for you. Um, the first of those questions um, is actually, which county is Atlanta Botanical Garden in? We're in Fulton County. Fulton so it's right County. in the middle of downtown Atlanta. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Okay, well, hopefully that got you the answer you were looking for. Um, if you need a follow-up question or question for that, um, feel free to pop that into the Q&A or chat. Um, the next question that we had um, was uh, regarding how many people um, does Atlanta Botanic Garden employ in order to keep the gardens looking so beautiful? We have a huge staff. So we have the outdoor horticulturists that work outdoors. I don't know offhand how many are in that department. I want to say like 20-ish, more or less. And then we also have an indoor staff, also probably maybe right around 20-ish. But we have a conservation department, naturally of marketing. I'm in education and programs. Um, we have visitor services. So we have a huge staff here. I want to say in the couple hundreds, but I don't know. Please don't quote me on that and call the <laughs> HR department. <laughs> I, I, I won't do any reporting, I promise. <laughs> um, how many total linear feet is the, um, the installation in the garden? The new I didn't get that statistic, the installation for the poetic kinetics, the yes. piece that goes. I just know that it's square foot wise. 12,500 square feet ish. That's just amazing. So I don't know how long it is. I know it's lowest height. It goes 28 feet off the ground to 90 feet off the ground. That's the range it goes from up to down. Uh, I, I can't, I'm hoping to come see it while it's in action. Do, actually, personal question um, How long will it be up for? Till mid September. Mid September. Okay. Mm -hmm. Got to get, got to get down to Atlanta. Yeah. Um, another question is, um, are there any admission fees to visit the Atlanta Botanic Garden? You kind of broke up a little. Any what fees? I'm so sorry, admission fees. Admission fees. Yes, there are admission fees to come. Um, there is the reciprocal membership. So if any of you guys are members to other Botanic Gardens, there is a reciprocal membership that you could come visit our garden for free. And um, offhand, I don't have the price for us to come. I also am afraid to quote that online. I want to say it's 18 to $25. Oh, look it up before you come, <laughs> depending on if you're a kid or adult. Um, we also encourage you to, to join one of your local botanic gardens. Um, and then um, I believe that Atlanta is actually part of the reciprocal um, membership garden program. So then mm -hmm. you can always visit Atlanta Botanic Garden for free. So. Yeah. Um, Another question that came in is, um, do you have any Halloween or Christmas programs or decorations that they could um, anticipate visiting later this fall or winter? Oh my before? gosh, do we ever. We have a Scarecrows exhibition. So we partner, we offer to local businesses, families. We have over a hundred different school, Scarecrow sculptures, I'm calling them, because they are so unique. They are not the standard sc Scarecrows that you would see. And we have a huge pumpkin display. We get, we, I don't know, thousands of pumpkins. And they create mosaics and patterns with the pumpkins all around. That's really neat. And then we also have garden lights. We've had that since 2010. And we have lights hanging from the treetops that are synchronized to music. We have bliss lighting in our conservatory with frogs calling, walking through there. We have orbs that are also to music. Our, ice god, our earth goddess becomes the ice goddess with glittery hair. So the holidays, if you guys haven't seen garden lights, it's incredible. And I think it's worth the trip to see. 
Perfect. If anyone else has any questions, please feel free to um, get those in the chat or in the Q&A. Um, the recordings of this presentation and the others um, should be up for, for several more months, we think, before the website would get pulled down. Um, we'll, we'll try and find a, a home for, for those videos even after the website potentially goes down. So we'll try and communicate that with anyone who attended. Um, so lots of people giving their, their thanks. Um, that it was a beautiful tour. Um, thank you for sharing. It was great seeing the plants up close. So thank you so much, Catherine, for joining us. Thank um, you so much. So on that note, we are now going to take a hop and a skip, um, just a few hundred miles, if that, um, up um, I-85 to Clemson, South Carolina, where I am very um, glad to get to introduce Sue Watts, who is the Educational Program Manager for the South Carolina Botanical Garden. Take it away, Sue. Well, thank you so very much. Um, that was just a really lovely presentation. Um, like I've been to Atlanta Botanical with my children and we have the reciprocal membership. So we got in free and it was very exciting to get in free. And it's just such a beautiful experience. Um, I'm going to share my screen uh, and get back to the beginning. Um, I don't have quite the technology, so... Um, this is uh, what I'm going to talk about today is the magic of plant place and plants and natural heritage trail, natural, natural heritage garden trail. This is a new um, gate that we got in just a few years ago. People used to come to the botanical gardens and drive in and go, where's the garden? Um, now you can't have any excuse. This is a really lovely thing. Let me tell you a little bit about our history before we get onto our trail. Um, let's see. Here's a map. Um, we're, okay. we're actually 10 times bigger than the Atlanta Botanical Garden, which is pretty stunning to think about. Um, we have about 300 acres. We were founded in 1959 with the movement of a few camellias over to the side of this duck pond, which wasn't actually there then. Um, and we've grown slowly um, over time and added different amounts of, of land. We got a big grant from our forestry department. Uh, we are part of Clemson University and we are actually part of the original plantation of John C. Calhoun. So um, it's a very historic place. We're in the upstate of South Carolina. We are in the foothills of the Blue Ridge. Um, so we have 300 acres. The tour I'm going to talk take you on today is this line that goes through the center of the garden. Um, I've been here 20 years and when I first came here all of this was where you walked. Um, it was very developed. There's a hosta garden um, and some historic properties and then about 10 years ago we started working on this natural heritage garden trail and it goes from the maritime forest of South Carolina down here, and you walk through all the habitats of South Carolina um, and come into the Piedmont forests and then up into the Blue Ridge habitats. So what's really nice about this is that you walk through, you feel like you're really there. So um, this is South Carolina. If you're not familiar with our geography, the Blue Ridge is up here. We are right about here with the garden. Um, this is what's called the Piedmont. This is the Sand Hills. Um, this is the center of the state. This is our state capital. And then below that is um, inner and outer coastal plains. And you're gonna see as we go along this trail um, down to the maritime forest, you're gonna see habitats that are here still no longer here and so we're going to step back in time not only uh going a long distance we're going to travel you know the whole length of the state but we're also going to go back in time as well um and i hope you enjoy it because it's very beautiful when you first come here this is our visitor center up on the top of the hill this was the southern living showcase home for a while we had a partnership for, with southern living and they built this house, they built the carriage house, actually 
I'm sitting right in that window. That's my office right there. Um, and then below it is our geology museum. One thing I didn't mention, I'll mention now, is that we're actually open to the public every day of the year free. So you can always come here um, and it's free. And our geology museum is also free. So it's a wonderful resource for the local area. This is the path that you would walk along um, to get to the beginning of the trail. We have a very large parking lot right here. And right away you get immersed into South Carolina plants. This, these are live oaks and they were planted about five or six years ago. So they're slowly beginning to grow. And eventually in 50 years or so, we'll have a beautiful canopy that you'll walk along to get to the trail. Um, that's one thing I really like about this project is we've really transformed the landscape. And I'm going to show you some of that as we go through. Um, the area that we put this end of the trail in was just grass and we had to mow it every single week. And it's several um, tens of acres. And so it was taking a lot of resources. It was taking a lot of manpower, uh, human power. And so transforming this landscape has meant that we've cut back on a lot of the resources that we were putting towards it. Um, so this is the beginning. You walk along this and you can't see it, but this trail is actually sand, beach sand. So you immediately feel like you're at the beach. The very first habitat we come to, I took this picture down on Edisto Island, South Carolina, and this is a maritime forest. You can see the palmetto trees, the live oaks, and then an understory of things like yopon holly, um, toothache tree, things like that. So this is what the real thing looks like. And I'm gonna show you, you'll come to what we have now, but also show you the stages of how we did this. Um, this is the grass that I was telling you about. Um, and this is about 10 years ago when we put in uh, palmetto trees and um, this is a live oak and then a magnolia over here. And you can see the grass. Um, this is our shell ring, Native American shell ring. And I'm gonna talk to you about that um, in just a few minutes. But this space was what was supposed to be mowed the whole time. Um, this gives you a little bit of an idea of scale also, because this is our um, carnivorous plant exhibit. And we'll see that also in a few minutes. All right. So after we put in the trees, the, the canopy, we put in the understory and you can see mooly grass right here. Um, you can see oh, what else is down here whole bunch of different things. I know there's Bacchus in here, um, but we've put sand in, we've put in an understory, we've started creating the space. Um, this is what it looked like a couple of years ago. Um, it's, this is in the fall and you can, and it's even much more luscious now. You can actually you feel like you're going into this real um, enclosed space. It just feels like the beach. We've got a boardwalk right here. Um, and the shell ring that is over here, and I'm going to talk about that just a few minutes. The goal for this trail is to really hook people into understanding not only the plants and experiencing the plants, but also the culture of South Carolina. And so um, we have signs along the um, the walkway that talk about the history of the palmetto and how it's so important to South Carolina history. It was used to build early forts during the Revolutionary War, Fort Moultrie. Um, and it's actually not really a tree, even though it's our state tree, it's actually a grass um, and it's got a very spongy trunk. And so what happened was when the British uh, fired their cannons at this fort, those, um, what do you call that? Bombs, cannonballs, cannonballs. They were pushed back, uh, they bounced off. And so um, this is a very important uh, part of South Carolina's history and iconography. It's also wonderful for wild plants, for wildflower, for wildlife, sorry, misspeaking. Um, when you see this in flower, it's got these beautiful sprays of, of white flowers that 
uh, covered in bees and and wasps and and all kinds of things and then the the berries are used are eaten by lots of wildlife so the com combination of the culture and the nature are in this plant um, this is mooly grass also known as sweet grass it's absolutely beautiful again it's wonderful for wildlife um, lots of small critters take cover in it um, but it's also used by the african-american people who were brought here for, forcibly um, who have a wonderful tradition of weaving and sweetgrass baskets are just a huge part of the low country tradition um, and so we honor that in this space um, and then the last thing is native american culture uh, we have Yelpon holly or Alex vomitoria, and that's throughout this area of, of the Natural Heritage Garden Trail. And um, it was actually not just used by Native Americans, but it was actually farmed by Native Americans. And there is evidence of plantations of this all the way up um, inland where it wouldn't have naturally grown. So uh, the idea of honoring all groups of people who come together and make South Carolina it home and have done over time. Um, this is our Native American shell ring. And the one I've seen is down on Edisto Island and it looks very similar to this, although it's being worn away by the, by the water. Um, this was a collaborative effort with local restaurants who gave us their uh, oyster shells for quite some time. And we had lots of oyster, oyster roasts up in the area. The story of this part is that Native Americans lived here, obviously, way before Europeans were here. And there they were um, changing the landscape by their habits. So one of the uh, messages for this is that everything that a person does changes the environment. And in the case of this, as they threw down those net, net, uh, oyster shells, they changed the pH of the soil. And so you have plants on this oystering that you wouldn't find anywhere else in the low country. So this is a low country feature by the coast. And you can find these places by the um, kinds of plants that are on these shell rings. Um, once we've gone through the shell ring and the maritime forest, we come to a habitat that is quite distinctive and is not really um, here anymore. It used to be 90% of the area from the coast up to Columbia, um, the middle of the state was longleaf pine savanna. Uh, these areas in which the trees were widely spaced, that there was wire grass underneath. And then in pockets, there was areas where the soil would not drain very well. And so these are, we saw these a lot in the talk that Catherine just gave, pitcher plants that are in these very boggy areas. Um, so this was the extent of the range of longleaf pine um, right up. This is the middle of our state, the fall line only about 5% of that habitat remains today. And so we've actually recreated that here in the um, botanical garden. And what was really interesting to me, one Labor Day, I went away, I drove past this space and there was nothing. And then I came back after a three day weekend and there was this longleaf pine savanna um, planting of these trees. This is what it looked like yesterday. Um, this is a view from the road. This used to be grass about 10 years ago. And you can see there's birds here. There's a little bird right there. The trail is actually through here, through the back um, of this. And it's, it's just beautiful. It's magical. This is an intensely diverse habitat. Um, and I would never remember the numbers. So I wanted to write them down. Um, a diversity of 150 to 300 species of ground cover per acre, more breeding birds than any other southeastern forest type. About 60% of the amphibian and reptile species found in the southeast are found here. 
and at least 122 endangered or threatened plant species. What's neat about the story of this, this is the boardwalk, the maritime forest is right here. These are two, I think this is a pond cypress. Um, this boardwalk on either side is, they dug down about three feet and then they filled it up with um, sand and peat moss and then went down to the coast where land was being destroyed for development and cut out squares of, um, of the land and brought it up. They didn't know exactly what they had. They just brought it back up, stuck it in there. And we have this tremendously lush space. These are, um, you'll see it a little more closer in just a minute. Uh, this is it close up and just the diversity, the beauty of it, um, the color. You've got the longleaf pine in the background. You've got the pitcher plants. This is meadow beauty and milkwort. Um, this was a plant that uh, we had a lot last year. It's um, Erygium ravenellii, and it was a discovery made um, by Patrick McMillan, our director. And I should mention that this is all the brainchild of Patrick McMillan, who was our um, uh, director at the time. And he had this vision, and he's the person who really has... Um, just made that vision reality. And it's just been such a wonderful treat to watch that change over time. Because we can't bring, we don't have tortoises like they do at the Atlanta Botanical Garden. Um, so we've done some of that referencing to the wildlife that's unique to these areas. And actually last weekend, I managed to go down to a gopher tortoise um, Heritage Preserve, which is down in Aiken, and didn't see any tortoises, so at least we're ahead on that, but did see tortoise homes, and then the red cockaded wood, woodpecker. So we talk about these animals on the signs and how they're key to the environment. Both of those, those animals are keystone species, and their um, homes provide habitat for many, many other species. So these are the signs that we have along the, the way that help people um, understand a little better the habitats that they're going through. Not just the animals that would be there, some of the things that they're seeing, but also the history as well. Ah, fire, we'll talk about that in just a minute. We also have um, carnivorous plant exhibit. It's outside and um, like I said, along the boardwalk, but if you're old like me, you like it to get up close and personal to you. And this is a wonderful place for kids to hang out. And um, it's not particularly big, but you can really get up close and personal to things like the Venus flytrap. Just to give you a size, is everything okay? Just to give you an idea of um, the size, these Venus flytraps, this is a teeny tiny moss back here. So um, these are very, very small. Um, okay, so we've now walked through that first part of the state and we're up to the middle of the state. This is um, an area called a Pocosin. It's a swamp on a hill. And it, basically it's an area where there's clay underneath and then sand on top. So the water goes down very, very quickly, but then hits that clay and seeps out. So we've created this seepage area um, and there are pitcher plants in here, there. Those are the flowers of pitcher plants. Um, and this is basically Eastern white cedar and lots of different kinds of bay trees. And again, that you can see the sign there. We have a QR code on the sign so that you can see um, the website. So you can go to the website and as well as having information about the plants, the habitats, the people, we also have videotapes of Patrick McMillan um, recording and talking about the spaces. Okay, deep breath. We've gone a long way. Here's a map. So we've walked up, 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 and we're here. This is the Sand Hills National Wildlife Refuge. This is a picture of what it looks like um, in the actual space. These are longleaf pines and um, the wire grass. 
Now, the, the story we talk about here also is, and, and back at the Savannah, is about Native Americans. These were not, um, quote unquote, natural spaces. For thousands of years, Native Americans actually managed these areas to get them the way they wanted by the use of fire. So many of these species, particularly the longleaf pine, but also the wiregrass are fire adapted and they thrive if there's low intensity intermittent fire. Um, they actually need them to be sustained and to grow. Um, there's a huge biology about that, and I won't tell you about that, but um, one of the aspects of the story is that uh, Native Americans used fire um, to maintain this habitat. This is our Sound Hills exhibit. This is grass that's just, um, uh, this is longleaf pine that's just come out of the grass stage and is starting to grow. Um, this is gives you an idea of development over time. These are the trees and the boardwalk and the um, and actually you can see that there's a, a pine tree, a palmetto tree that's laying down down there. So this was a while ago and this was a couple of weeks ago. Um, I walked through here I think a week ago. Um, and you just get the sense of being within the longleaf pine um, sandhills region of the state. We burn in the botanical garden. We've been doing it for the past five years or so. Um, like we said, these habitats are fire um, dependent. And so this was about, I think we burned in April this year. And this is what it looked like. Um, that nice lush area I just showed you is right here. And that's what this is. And we burned so that the plants, we don't get any of the um, hardwoods coming in and we um, maintain um, the, 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 the grasses and they thrive. This tree looks kind of raggedy, but it's gonna be fine. Um, it's pretty amazing. So we're now moving beyond Columbia um, around Columbia, there's a, oh, sorry, these are some of the Sandhills plants that you would see um, over time. And one thing that's so wonderful about all these plants is that they are covered because they're native. They have a relationship with our local insects. And so goldenrod, the milkweed, obviously that's a plant for monarchs. And this is covered in bees all the time. So when you walk this um, this trail, not only are you seeing these wonderful plants, you're also experiencing the, the, the um, uh, insects that would be along here too. This is a very small exhibit, but it's kind of a really neat one. It's a granite, granitic flat rock. It mimics the kind of habitat that we would have at some place called 40 acre rock, which is a granite, granitic dome that's come out through the um, the sand hills and this area is um, very 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 hot, um, probably even hotter than the sand hills habitat. Um, and so all the plants in here, the ragwort, the woolly ragwort, and the um, mm, spiderwort are adapted for these really hot conditions. Um, and so that's a really neat thing to show people. When we give tours, we're always talking about plant adaptations and how each of these plants adapts to its specific geographic area. Okay, so this is South Carolina in the Piedmont. This is where I live. Um, and it doesn't look like this now, but at one time it did the early um, explorers who came to this area talk about the bison that were here. Um, this is a drawing by Mark Catesby of a bison that was here in South Carolina. There were wolves here. He talks about wolves and elk and bison being here. And so that's something, and up till around, I think about 1850, they were able to hunt about 20 or 30 bison a day if a person went out. So they were quite, quite abundant here. Uh, Native Americans maintained the landscape so that they could essentially farm, but not farm bison. 
This is our um, prairie now. We are so lucky because the landscape really um, cooperated. This area of John C. Calhoun's plantation had never been used for cotton farming and it had only ever been used for grazing. So the soil horizon here is intact in a way that in most places in the upstate, it is not intact. Um, all that cotton farming meant that most of our soil is down in Charleston. Um, but here we are able to recreate um, grasses that are bigger than a person's head. So when you walk down this trail, the grasshoppers are crazy and it's, it's amazing. We've really gone from a, basically a lawn to this wonderful area that has so much um, plant life in it, so much of the uh, crickets and grasshoppers. And then we have um, snakes and rodents. And so we've really changed the biota here. Um, we've started seeing great horned owls in a way that we would never seen them before, and they've moved into the area. We don't yet have a um, bison. I have lobbied for some bison. I think a cute one would be really nice, um, but no, they think that it's too much to manage. These are some of the grasses that we have here in this space. Um, again, grasses, I think sometimes are underestimated for what they do for wildlife. Um, I did a talk on caterpillars and butterflies yesterday and found out there's a whole group of uh, grass skippers that rely on grasses. So um, this is some of the grasses we have. And then we have some very rare endemics. Um, Georgia aster is a very rare plant that we have here and we grow. We have smooth, smooth comb flower, the echinacea, and then we have Schweinitz's sunflower. So these are all very rare endemics. Um, we used to grow all different kinds of smooth comb, all different kinds of comb flower, but this is the only comb flower that we grow now because it, it um, hybridizes so quickly. So we keep just this one. I think it's federally endangered. Um, we burn, this is us burning a couple of years ago. Um, it's a really fun thing, it's over very quickly, but then um, we usually uh, burn between February or April. We, we burn pretty late this year. All right, so I talked about how the um, landscape cooperated for the prairie. We in the garden had this place called the Leaky Pond. Um, and it was, I'll, sh I'll show you a picture and then maybe I'll come back to this um, a, and talk about what a Carolina Bay is. So it looks like this. It's really beautiful. Um, there are Carolina Bays down on the coast of South Carolina. They are all oriented the same way. They all have a similar kind of um, uh, plant material around it. Um, and for the longest time, we didn't really know much about them. And they were really discovered when they started doing aerial photography and flying over these areas. And you could see these depressions. There are some very strange uh, theories about why they are there. One of my favorite is a giant fishes were um, flopping around and they made these spaces. Uh, another somewhat debunked theory is that they were meteor hits, and that's not true. And really, that's an area of um, controversy. But this is our Carolina Bay. But this was a pond that we had that we called the Leaky Pond, and it would empty and fill with the rainfall. And that's what the Carolina Bays do. So not looking a gift horse in the mouth, we made this our Carolina Bay. Um, it's not geographically in the right place, but you can't have everything. And again, this is um, a, one of our signs that shows you more about those, um, these places. And you can see some ones in real life, and this is what they look like on this um, aerial photo photography. Okay, so, all right. I've sort of jumped over um, the habitat that we have here now in South Carolina. It's basically a mixed um, oak hardwood forest with oaks and hickories. Um, and that is really viewed here as being natural, but really it wasn't 
particularly natural. That's a habitat that has sprung up after all of the farming that was around here. The Europeans clean, cleared the land and farmed fairly intensively the cotton. And once all of those farms went out of business around the depression, this second growth of forest came in. And so the forest that we have here in the botanical garden, and this is actually what it looks like, um, is the trees are only about 70 years old. Um, they grew up after the land was abandoned from cotton farming. Um, but anyway, this is our sign for the Natural Heritage Trail. How are we doing? Um, and you can see we've got an aerial photograph here. This is our Rich Cove Forest. And in this space, um, we've put down, the soil has been amended to make it very um, amenable to lots and lots of wildflowers. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of a flavor of that. We've just really gone through the peak of that coming here in April is the best time. Whereas seeing the other end of the trail, the maritime forest and the um, boggy areas is really like late summer. So you can always see something here. There's always something new. Um, so this is our Rich Cove forest. And this is it in April with the May apples and the flocks. Um, the ferns are coming up. You can see them here. Uh, what else is in here? Nothing that I can see clearly, but this gives you an idea of the diversity of this specific um, exhibit that we have, the Rich Cove Forest. So we've got Oconee Bells. We have an Oconee Bell exhibit. Um, these plants, these are actually in the Acidic Cove Forest, but they're very rare to this area. They were um, found by Michaud and then rediscovered um, much, much later by a young boy. And in between, Asa Gray spent, who is the father of botany in North America, spent much of his life trying to find these plants. Um, and we have a colony in the garden that probably Asa Gray looked at because he rescued these plants when they built the, um, the, the lakes around us. So, um, so huge diversity in this area. We've got um, Kate Spee's Trillium. We've got foam flower, May apple. These are, um, this is the flocks. We've got Jack in the pulpit. So really from about March, even February to March and April and May, it is a phenomenal um, thing to go out every day and see new things. This is our acidic cove forest. You just cross a bridge and you're in something that's much more evergreen. Um, predominantly rhododendron, azaleas, and mountain laurel. Um, and uh, this is actually where the uh, Oconee Bells are. Sorry, getting tired. So, um, so this is the acidic cove forest. And then at the end of the trail, we just lucked out to have this beautiful structure. This is called the Hunt Cabin. This is a very nice house that was built in 1820s in upstate South Carolina. These people um, who lived here, there's a family called the Hunts. And in 1850, this house was built in 1826. It was actually moved to the garden. In 1850, seven children and three adults lived here. We know from the census. Um, but we also know that these people were slaveholders. And in 1850, they owned two young women, one who was 14 and one who was 18. And there was a baby boy who was one year old. Um, we use, we don't open it all the time. I'm a historian by training. And so when I got here, we started doing programming and, and opening this place up once a month to, um, to visitors and having um, living history. So if you come on the right weekend, you might see Mary making something over the fire or her husband, Bill, making something outside and try yourself, try your hand at something hands-on that's appropriate. Um, okay, so that's, that's my trail. Um, uh, my name is Sue Watts. I am an educator here. And if you need to, um, contact me. That's my email. And I would love to see you in the garden and come and visit us very soon. Okay. 
Thank you so much, Sue. It was so fun to see um, this garden brought to life through your, your pictures and, and the way that you were able to tell the story of the, the Heritage Trail. It was just Thank you. wonderful. Um, we had lots of thanks for the tour. Um, <laughs> I, I love this comment from Susan. We covered a lot of ground. All the areas are so beautiful and unique. Um, they appreciated hearing about the history of each other, of each area, um, and <laughs> wish their office had as lovely of a view as yours does. <laughs> um, we do have some questions for you. Um, mm -hmm. The first is, um, what kind of transportation or, or how would you move through each of the collections? Okay, so this looks really big, but it's not very... Far. It's about um, half a mile to three quarters of a mile. And so it's it's accessible on foot. Um, I think you could do it with um, a motorized wheelchair. It would be more difficult with a push wheelchair, but most of it is accessible. But because we're in the Piedmont, we do have some areas where it's a little less accessible. Um, just because of this, the structure of the, the ground. So, but we, this is only a tiny fragment of what we have here. On top of this, we have a lot of display gardens at the front that are much more accessible. We also have a, um, a cactus garden, a Southwestern garden. Um, so there's many ways you can actually drive through the whole garden. Um, so there's many ways you can do it, but this, this is more of a foot traffic thing. Does that answer? Yes, thank yeah. you, Sue. Um, so, I, and Kathleen, I'm gonna laugh at this only because I'm so familiar with the South Carolina Botanic Garden um, and, and what the implications of this would be. But uh, the question is, is there thought of reintroducing a bison herd to maintain the grassland? <laughs> well, I said I want to and they won't. <laughs> but having said that, you know, um, it would be nice to have just a, uh, a gra like the, the the um, glass that was at the Atlanta Botanical Garden, if we could get something like that. But actually I drove outside of Anderson, South Carolina, which is the next town over last weekend. And they have bison, they have bison there. So um, we can't afford it, I'm sure, but um, maybe- I have a feeling I, the horticulturalists would not be happy about no. their, uh, <laughs> where they might roam within the garden. Well, if we could keep them enclosed, that would be, don't get me excited. I'm excited <laughs> about the idea. Um, so the next question is right up your alley, Sue, with your, your historian background. Um, and this is how many rooms are in the hunt cabin um, to be able to hold 10 people? Um, were, where were slave quarters and were they subsistence farmers? Okay. So that's, that's, um, so we know that they were predominantly subsistence farmers, but they did grow some things. Um, they were, there was a barter system. Um, they, they grew corn and potatoes, we know from the agricultural uh, schedule. Um, so the house is interesting because this house was actually in the middle of another house. And so as the family um, prospered, it got bigger and bigger and bigger. And then when they were pulling the house down, they found this cabin in the middle. And so actually the cabin is only two rooms. It's only one room now, but it used to be two rooms. There was a room at the base of the stairs and it would have been probably a ladder for the children to sleep in a sleeping loft upstairs. We think the parents would have slept at the base of the stairs because you have to think in 1826, this was the frontier. There was um, wild animals, there were Native American people who, you know, that kind of thing um, until they removed them in 1832 from the area. So the parents would have slept at the bottom of the stairs but grandma, I'm not sure where she would have been. So uh, the slave quarters, I'm sure it was probably a shack, um, but we don't know. Um, we contrast this to local, we're in an interesting area because the town I live in, which is seven miles down the road from here, is was the summer home of the planters from Charleston. And so there's big Charleston style houses up here that were built built around the same time. So we're able to contrast those two things. So, sorry, you'll get me on a tent and talk and talk and talk. <laughs> Did that, was that all of it? So think yeah. upstairs, parents downstairs and grandma, we don't know. Thank you so much, Sue. 
Um, so lots of recommendations in the chat and the Q and A. Um, to, to, to be check, be sure to check out. Um, if anyone else has any questions, feel free to pop those into chat or Q and A. And um, I'm sure Sue wouldn't mind uh, reading through or answering those. Um, or email me. Yep. Yes. So thank you so much, Sue, for the time and for, for the wonderful tour. Um, greatly appreciate it. Um, and we are now going to um, board a plane. Uh, this is not a short jaunt, but we're going to jump all the way over to Colorado where we're going to explore the gardens on Spring Creek. Um, and so I would love to welcome Ashley Kruger to join us. Ashley, Everyone. I can hear you. I'm just missing your video. Um, it says I you have to give me permission to have oh, my video no. on. I'm so sorry. Yes, of course you can have permission. There we go. Hey, Hi, Ashley. Everybody. Welcome. Thanks for having well, me. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go ahead and let you pull up your PowerPoint or a video or anything you need to share, and I'm going to let you take it away. All right. Sounds wonderful. Well, um, we are located in Fort Collins, Colorado, and today we actually have a special video that we wanted to share with you. Um, we're going to be giving going into a virtual dive into our um, hardy cacti garden with Lauren Springer Ogden. She's on staff with us um, and has designed several of our gardens. If you're familiar with her Undaunted Garden book, she has a garden by that name um, here at the Gardens on Spring Creek. So we'll start with that video and then we'll follow up with a brief PowerPoint just covering a little of the basics that aren't covered in the video. And then if you have any questions, I'd love to answer them. So I will go ahead and share the video. Just takes a second to get to it, sorry. Well, I had it ready to go. Oh. Can you see that? Looks great. Okay, hopefully I remembered to click the sound button when I shared my screen. I guess we'll find out. Do you have sound? We do not have sound. <laughs> ah, I knew it, I was so worried about I was so worried about uh, sharing it appropriately. So you, you stopped sharing the video, but you haven't stopped sharing your screen. So yep. sorry about that. <laughs> I am now sharing sound. much more on top of my technology than I am today. All right, how about that? We are rocking and rolling now. Okay. Welcome to the gardens on Spring Creek, the city of Fort Collins Community Botanic Garden. Through an important partnership with the city of Fort Collins, we offer 12 acres of carefully curated gardens that are an amazing place to come with your family or on your own to rest, to heal, to celebrate, to connect with nature, to explore, to learn, and to just be inspired. Whether you're watching the bees in our children's garden or getting up close to a zebra longwing in our North American butterfly house, there are ample opportunities for connection. Another important part of the mission of the gardens on Spring Creek is to inspire stewardship through horticulture. Nowhere is that more relevant and tangible than here in our Garden of Eaton. This three quarter acre food garden donates thousands of pounds of produce every year to our Larimer County Food Bank through the Plant It Forward program. All our gardens aim to inspire plant lovers to think about the impact of what they're planting. It may be for beauty, for pollinators, for sustainability, or to flourish in our daunting Colorado seasons. A great example of that is our Undaunted Garden. We have Lauren Springer, the garden's designer and horticulturalist, here to tell us about creating a regionally resonant garden. 
This three quarter acre garden here is my area. Um, it's called the Undaunted Garden, um, basically named after my first book. Undaunted being all about uh, the fact that it's kind of hard to grow plants in our soil and our climate and using plants here and showcasing plants here in beautiful ways, plants that can take our climate and can tolerate our soils and thrive. Um, so it's all about low water plants, about what plants that can stand heavy clay soils, high pH, super cold winters, dry cold winters, we don't get dependable snow cover, um, and also sometimes brutally hot summers, hail, all kinds of things, fires this year, a lot of pollution from the fires, um, and still have a garden that's full of plants that are doing well, um, diverse, and attracting lots of pollinators. Many natives here, it's about 60% native and 40% plants that are adapted to our region. Many from South Africa, um, from the Mediterranean, Central Asia, areas that similarly have difficult soils and challenging climates. This garden here, um, the Chaparral Garden, is really actually, in my sense, I think the most useful and beautiful for our climates. Um, it's very low maintenance because the shrubs in these long-lived perennials need very little care once they're established. And it has a lot of texture. And our textures out here and our colors out here are different than in the Midwest or on the coasts. Um, it's a lot more silver, gray-green, not this lush green look. And the textures aren't as bold and as lush. They're finer textured, scruffier looking. Um, and they play with light and wind really beautifully. Lots of grasses, fine textured things like this rabbit brush. Um, and silver plants like that Artemisia right here. Um, those kinds of plants are really the, the cornerstones of a chaparral garden. And there are a lot of bulbs in this garden, which give you a lot of spring color, and then they die down, and then you have these kinds of plants to carry the rest of the season and on in through the winter. So this is the smallest section of the Undaunted Garden, but in some ways it's probably the most exciting. Uh, it is at this point in time, the largest collection of winter hardy cacti shown, showcased in an outdoor garden setting in the United States. And there is at least three dozen different species of cacti here and over 400 individual plants, as well as many companion plants with them. They're long lived, they play with the sun, their spines, their flowers are translucent. So when you have backlighting in the early morning or late afternoon, they actually glow like stained glass. And they have so many interesting forms and they really are living sculpture. And that said, if you only have cacti in a garden, they can look a little bit plastic because they are so bold and sculptural. And they can look a little bit mean because all you see is this, all, these, all this armature, all these spines. So it's important to mix in other plants to soften them and make them look like they would look in nature where they have lots of different companions. So there's almost as many companion plants in here as there are cacti. And that's really the, the, the best effect here is to have that juxtaposition of these very bold and spiny, um, very self-important looking plants and then some softer textures and also plants that bloom at different times. Cacti have gorgeous flowers. They come in all colors but blue, and they're very large in most cases and, and translucent, and pollinators love them. But they bloom for a very short period of time. So if you want color in here, except for in late spring and early summer when the cacti are blooming, you've got to introduce some other companion plants for that kind of blossom color. The other thing to think about when you're gardening with, uh, with cacti and when you're creating a cactus garden is to think about incorporating rock. Because in nature they grow a lot of times in very stony parts of the desert. They like to have rock mulch around them. That's what they're, they're used to in the desert. That's the kind of things that are covering the soil in the desert. It's not bark mulch, it's not pieces of wood or compost, it's little pieces of rock. And the other thing is that stone helps warm the soil it helps reflect heat on the cacti. And here in Colorado, they want a little more heat than we sometimes can give them. So some of these are native to the Southwest, further South and further West. Uh, many from New Mexico and Arizona, and some even as far down as, as Northern Mexico. And so if we can increase that heat uh, and also protect their roots in the winter a little bit with these, these rocks, the larger rocks and with the rock mulch, we make them much happier. And they also look really good with the rocks. So I would highly recommend using rocks with your cacti. 
Thank you so much for joining us today. We explored, we learned, you saw a little bit about who we are, and we hope to see you soon at the Gardens on Spring Creek. All right. Well, that is a little bit of who we are and in um, effort to keep the time with my technological challenges. Um, if anyone has any questions about who we are or what we do, I'd be happy to answer them. No, it wasn't a whole lot. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was a, a really great video. Um, we don't have any questions that have come in yet, but of course, feel free, anyone who has any questions for Ashley to just pop them in the chat or Q&A and we'll get those answered. Um, Ashley, had you mentioned that you have a PowerPoint um, as well? I do have a PowerPoint. Um, I just didn't know because I couldn't see the chat. I didn't know if there were any questions. Um, it's not a very long PowerPoint. I just wanted to cover if there was anything else outside of it. So maybe as we're waiting for questions, I'll just. Sure, yeah. I'd love for you to go ahead and, and give us a glimpse of that PowerPoint as well. I think that'd be great. Um, so we are a public private garden um, and our, so we're part of the city of Fort Collins and we're also part nonprofit. And our mission is to be a world-class botanic garden that's community oriented, educational, experiential and sustainable. And we hope to enrich the lives of people and foster environmental stewardship through horticulture. So we have 18 acres, so we're smaller, we're on the smaller side of gardens um, with 12 acres of curated gardens um, and located very central in Fort Collins near the college campus. Our um, nonprofit side is called the Friends of the Gardens on Spring Creek and they help support us with um, philanthropy, philanthropy and fundraising. Um, we start, we were first envisioned in 1986 and broke ground in 2004. Um, and then we started adding gardens little by little um, until our big expansion, which occurred, we broke ground on our gardens in 2017 and really put them in in 2018. We added five and a half more acres of gardens to our existing um, five, four and a half, five gardens, uh, acres of gardens, excuse me. Um, and in our expansion, we have a prairie, a foothills, Lauren's undaunted garden, um, as well as the, um, the pavilion, which you see going up here, which is a concert venue. We were, we were able to have um, a few concerts last year, um, one with the symphony and then some smaller ones with our date nights, which was really um, awesome um, during a very difficult year for public gardens. Um, we also um, expanded our visitor center and added a North American butterfly pavilion in partnership with the Westminster butterfly pavilion. Um, so we have over 300 different North American butterflies all year round. Um, one of the, as Lauren said, one of the largest collections of cold hardy cacti. Um, and all of our gardens are really focused at inspiring um, the gardeners to either or to plan their gardens with intention. So whether that's for beauty, for pollinators, for water conservation, um, we have tons of natives adapted plants and really water wise landscapes. Um, in addition to a children's garden, which is more of the traditional um, fun green garden. We do do tours. If you are um, in our area, we'd love to set up a tour. We um, often have groups that travel um, out and come in to visit. Um, we, Colorado is opening up, um, we, and we have been doing in-person tours for um, quite a while. We also have a ton of adult classes. Most of them are online right now, um, as most botanic gardens are doing, and they will continue to stay online. So if you are in our region, come on by. We're starting to do some hybrid classes in person. If you're not, check out our list because we have a ton of things that are also virtual. We do a bunch of really fun special events, um, including our Garden of Lights um, and our pumpkins on parade, which is new. Um, lots of date nights, concerts. And yeah, we have a, our website is fcgov.com slash gardens. We have a Facebook and an Instagram page and we put out a NOCO Bloom publication, which has won some awards with APGA 
um, in our local newspaper, but digital copies can also be downloaded on our website. Okay, that's what I got. <laughs> so if there are any questions, shoot them. Yes, there have actually been some questions that have come in. So thank you so much for the, the quick PowerPoint overview. I appreciate it. Um, so the first question that came in is, where is the garden in relation to the college campus? Yeah, we are directly south of the college campus. So we just put in, if you're familiar with Fort Collins, we just put in, a, or CSU just put in a big, giant, huge new stadium. And we are directly south of that along the Spring Creek Trail. So very Excellent. close for students. Um, and students actually can get $20 memberships. So it's a nice place to come. We have Wi-Fi throughout the ground, so you can come and study. Um, it's a nice, nice perk. <laughs> That's great. This definitely must be someone who's more familiar with the area because I'm afraid I don't even know which college is in Fort Collins. <laughs> uh, it's Colorado State University, the CSU. Okay, University. great. Perfect. Thank you, Ashley. The mm -hmm. next um, question slash comment we had was um, Susan had chimed in and said, I especially like the Garden of Eden. Can you talk a little more about the project? And thank you so much for sharing. Yeah, of course. Um, the Garden of Eden is a three quarter acre food garden. We mostly practice organic practices, though it's not an actually licensed organic garden. Um, we started a partnership several years ago called Planet Forward with the food bank um, in which we wanted to encourage um, a community output of local fresh produce um, into our local food banks. Because if you're familiar with food banks, it's often potatoes, onions, carrots, things that have very long shelf life um, and not necessarily fresh or nutrient rich produce. Um, so we primarily grow only for the food bank. We do use some produce in our programming. Otherwise, it all goes to the food bank. We're also a drop-off site for local champions within neighborhoods that collect extra produce from their um, neighbors. And so they can drop it off with us. They can drop it off at the food bank. Um, and then that helps diversify the fresh produce that's available to um, members of our community. Our horticulturist who's in charge of it too, does a really, really good job of thinking about things that are relevant to every culture, including um, peppers, eggplant, and tomatoes, um, and trying to find the most diverse selection of those possible. We have some of the craziest diversities of ethnic sweet peppers that I've ever heard of. Um, he's always looking for different eggplants, eggplants and peppers especially, from all across the globe that will grow well in Colorado so that no matter what culture you're coming from, if you come to the food bank, you might see something familiar. Thank you. Last year was like 7,000 pounds, I think we donated. It's amazing. I, mm -hmm. I love the connection between gardens and community like that. That's just wonderful. Um, next question we had was, are the annual and perennial trial gardens on campus? They are on campus, yeah, they are not us. We often get confused um, when people come looking for us or looking for them, um, but the annual um, trial gardens and the perennial trial gardens are part of CSU and they are on campus. We are a botanic garden and we're separate from that. Perfect. Um, let me see. Oh, what are the theme gardens and color walk? Great question. Um, our themed gardens, we have uh, several of them around the Great Pavilion. Um, we have a fragrance garden that's in raised beds, so it's easily accessible um, without having to lean over to the ground to smell it. Um, we have a traditional rose garden that has um, both um, all different kinds of roses. <laughs> and then we have a moon garden, which is especially designed um, to either attract nighttime pollinators um, or look like it grows on the moon, essentially. Um, so we have those three three gardens are our themed gardens there. That sounds so fun. Um, this is actually a perfect question to kind of dovetail into that. Um, and the question is what wildlife is present seasonally in the gardens? So sounds like yeah, you certainly a, catered to that with your moon garden. That's a great question. We have a ton of wildlife and I just actually sent out a note to all of our staff talking about all the babies in the garden right now. Um, we have, um, though we try and discourage the geese, the Canada geese, we get a lot of Canada geese. And we actually have two families with goslings by our wetlands currently. Um, we have a killdeer, if you're familiar with birds, um, a killdeer pair that has um, nested and laid eggs in our prairie garden. We have lots of garter, garter snakes. Um, when we have a family of bunnies, this, where we have gardens, there are rabbits and there are bunnies, much to our chagrin. 
Um, but these ones are particularly cute. We have a family of bunnies. So we have a baby and two parents um, living in our train garden in the children's garden. And they, um, because it's mostly succulents in there, they're not eating any of the um, foliage that we want to be there, but they are eating all the weeds. So we are actually kind of grateful for that. Um, we get raccoons, we get foxes, lots of blue herons, pelicans, um, tons of pollinators. Um, we do, we participate in the Bee Watch program. So we're always tracking um, native bees in our gardens, um, as well as butterflies. So tons of stuff. Well, I am afraid that we actually are out of time. Our today's program um, was supposed to wrap up at 7.45. So um, I think we'll probably call that a wrap, but thank you so much, Ashley. And if anyone has any questions that didn't get answered or that you didn't have um, on your mind quite yet, feel free to tag up Ashley either at their website or at her email address. And I'm sure she can answer those for you. Um, in the meantime, thank you to all of our attendees who have come out not only tonight, but um, every night of our Go Public Garden Days tours um, and who have joined us. Um, our videos will hopefully be up soon. Um, we'll have to see if our website tech is working tomorrow, but if not, they'll be up for sure first thing Monday. And of course, you can check out all the videos from um, the past week that are already up on the website. So uh, please take the time to go check those out. Um, the Go Public Gardens initiative is just getting started, so we'll have lots of events year-round and especially during Go Public Gardens days each May um, for you to participate in, and so please be sure and stay tuned for those. But um, in the meantime, thanks for joining us and have a great Saturday evening. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>